So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Activism Among Academics, Creating Change from the Ivory. My name is Erica Adams, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Justice Studies at San Jose State University, and I will be your moderator for this event. So this event is co-sponsored by the Division on People of Color and Crime and the Jane Ad Adams College of Social Work. So thank you so much for joining us. This summer, we saw our country erupt in protests over state perpetrated violence and the discriminatory treatment of people of color. So these are problems that many of us on the call today have experienced, researched, and worked to address. So today we'll be speaking with scholars at different stages of their careers about the activism that they have engaged in to address injustices within our society. So at this time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our accomplished panel. First, we have Dr. Brittany Battle. Dr. Battle is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Wake Forest University. Her research interests include social and family policy, poverty and undeservingness, conceptualizations of family and parenthood, <coughs> courts, social justice, and uh, culture and cognition. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Battle. The second panelist is Dr. Henrika McCoy. Dr. McCoy is an associate professor and interim associate dean for academic affairs and student services in the Jane Addams College of Social Work at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her professional interests center on African-American males mental health disorders, cross-system youth, and children, adolescents, and emerging adults. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. McCoy. Our third panelist is Dr. Sean Wilson. Dr. Wilson is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at William Patterson University. His research interests include race and crime, penology, Reentry and criminal justice policy. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Wilson. And our fourth panelist is Isaac Yablo. Mr. Yablo is a PhD student in the Department of Sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Recently, he has been involved in community work that is focused on improving community safety and well being and working to improve police community relations. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Yablo. So for today's panel, we'll actually divide it into two sections. The first will be a moderated discussion with the panelists. And during the second section, um, we'll take questions from the audience. So the first section is gonna last about 40 minutes. And this uh, panel is being recorded. So I do ask that you um, mute your mics if you're not speaking for the audience. And during the second part of the panel, when we're taking questions, you could just use your the raise hand function in the meeting to actually raise your hand and I'll call on you. So you can ask your question or you could put your question in the um, chat function below, okay? So at this point, I'll just have a moderated discussion with the, the panel. And the first question is, could you please tell us just a little bit about the types of activism that you've engaged in and what inspired you to pursue activism? I can jump in. Um, so I've told this story before, and my mom is on the on the Zoom, so she's going to laugh when she hears. But I think I had activism and organizing running through my spirit at a very young age. When I was in eighth grade, I led a walkout um, in a class where I felt that the teacher was being unfair and I led the class to the office and uh, had a meeting with the, with the teacher and that teacher ended up resigning that year. So that was my early um, introduction to the, the power of organizing, right? And, and speaking out about what 
were injustices in that class, right, on a much smaller scale. And then when I was an undergrad, um, I did much more organizing around racial justice issues. Um, there was an incident with a noose on campus when I was an undergrad at University of Delaware. And so we organized um, a sit-in in the president's office um, and put together a group of students who were then um, able to inform kind of how the administration responded after that. And I did a bunch of organizing stuff in grad school around um, climate issues. But then this summer, um, even though I did not have any intention of really taking a leadership role in organizing this summer, um, I was arrested at a protest um, for demanding justice for a black man, Mr. John Neville, who was murdered in the Forsyth County Detention Center where I live in, in North Carolina. Um, and so after that, um, arrest and and how the law how law enforcement here responded to um, our calls for justice for Mr. Neville, we decided that we had no choice but to um, begin an occupation. And so, um, with my comrades in, in our grassroots organization called Triad Abolition Project um, in in Winston. Um, we led a 49 day occupation of downtown Winston Salem and were eventually successful in getting some policy changes um, from the sheriff's department to make sure that they were not, um, Mr. Neville was placed into a, a hog tie type position, um, which is how he was killed. And so we got that, that maneuver banned um, and have done some other work. And so Ultimately, what inspires me to activism now is to contribute to the project of abolition and, of, and to the project of Black liberation. Um, and so we know that's a long project. And so that, that's what is motivating me now to continue um, doing the work that I'm doing. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences about the battle. Um, it seems like you've uh, been involved in activism since very young eh? and uh, you've uh, seen some accomplishments from your, your activism. So thank you for the work that you do. It's unfortunate that you were arrested, um, but I'm really appreciative of you sharing your experiences with us today. So another panelist, what, um, <clears throat> what types of activism have you been engaged in and what inspired you to get engaged in activism? Um, I would say I've, I've been an activist probably the majority of my life. Um, I actually remember the first um, protest that I participated in um, that my father took me out to and, and explained why we were out there. Um, fighting for justice. Um, there was a black, a young black woman named Taisha Miller who was killed um, by the Riverside Police Department in Riverside, California in, in 1998. And so I remember being out there. I remember meeting um, Reverend Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson. I remember Babyface was out there. So, you know, I was a young kid at the time and it just kind of, um, you know, that, it, that, that incident directly impacted me um, and my community. Um, and it kind of led to a, a lifetime commitment to social justice, to fighting for what's right, um, to being involved in the community um, as a criminologist. In my discipline of criminology and criminal justice, I think that's one of my main critiques with the discipline is the lack of involvement, real involvement in the community. Um, we study crime um, and the response to crime, but oftentimes we don't really examine how many of these institutions of social control are anti-Black institutions mm -hmm. and how these institutions and many of these flawed criminological sociological studies don't tell us anything, right? They don't change anything. And so that's really just been my, my um, take on being an, an ac activist, but also being an academic. Um, my dissertation was based on an ethnographic study I conducted in Baltimore after Freddie Gray. Um, I was in, I was in I'm Ferguson after Mike Brown. Um, I'm in my community here in, in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey, Patterson, Newark. Um, when I was a graduate student, undergraduate student at New Jersey City University, um, which is directly situated in the hood. Um, I literally lived in the hood. So these, these issues of inequality impacted me directly. Um, I remember some of my roommates who, who went through hell trying to navigate um, 
you know, they're, they're, they're over surveilled communities. When I went to Texas Southern for my doctorate, it was literally right across the street from CUNY Homes, um, the projects where um, George Floyd was from. So these issues, you know, directly impacted me, even as I was um, pursuing um, my, my academic journey. And so I couldn't really escape these issues. And so it's, it's really important for me to engage myself in activism uh, when it comes to my scholarship. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. You mentioned that uh, the criminal justice system doesn't necessarily go well uh, with activism and even academia. So from your experiences, how uh, do you think we could <clears throat> uh, better engage in activism through the criminal justice system or uh, even through academia? Well, I think it, it, it's up to, I would say like, like Isaac and, and the people who are coming behind us and, and, and junior faculty who are willing to stand up, who are willing to use their voices to hold institutions accountable. Um, I think that that's the next step. Um, I feel that we really don't have anything to lose. I think there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to being an activist scholar. Um, it, it, and, and I remember you know, people telling me like, don't, you know, don't say certain things, um, don't be your true authentic self. Um, you know, you're going to have to do things a certain way. And that really hasn't been my experience. You know, I've been able to hold people accountable. I've been able to call out people who I believe are problematic and racist. Um, and it kind of is what it is. And I do my job. Um, I publish. I'm highly productive. And have there been, um, you know, um, has there been pushback? Of course, right? There always is. There's retaliation, um, things of that nature. But if you're a fighter, um, you don't really worry about those things. You worry about fighting for what's right. And, and anything else that comes from it is just really um, comes with the territory. And so I, I just always advise, in particular, graduate students, we need y'all to speak up. Because when we don't speak up, we allow these systems of oppression to stay. And, and, and we empower them, actually, by not calling them out. And so whether it be in your department, um, whether it be at your institution, whether it be you being a member of a division that you feel isn't really um, living up to their principles, I think it's important for all of us to, to use our voices to call these, these people, institutions, and places out. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Dr. I'll go next, because I think that's kind of a nice segue for me, and that I think my activism um, and I would say I wouldn't call myself an activist. I think maybe by definition I am, but I think the way Dr. Wilson talked about it is a nice segue in that I've tried to be an activist in a very different way. So I grew up um, in Chicago in the North, but my parents are from the South. My mother's from Atlanta. My father's from Shreveport. He grew up in Texas. Um, they came North in the Great Migration. They were there during Jim Crow, et cetera. And so my upbringing, I think, is very different in terms of contextually how I was raised to see the world. And so I think that I've tried to see my own activism as changing the internal institutions that I'm a part of. So that may be the academic environment that I'm in, I'm challenging the IRB when they say for a research study about um, young black men, are you telling them to leave their guns at the door <laughs> with the assumption that all young black men have guns or are in gangs and really challenging that notion or challenging in conversations when there's discussions around um, can black students make it in a doctoral program, really challenging the notion of what that looks like. Or when I was in the field as a social worker, challenging the assumption that every young black person who is um, in a home or who's been in the child welfare system has only the road towards crime to be um, their next step. So I think my activism has been very different in terms of trying to make sure that the system that I'm in changes so that those roadblocks won't exist so that when people are engaged in activism externally, they have access to the opportunities that they deserve to have. And I, I think that's just influenced by the fact that my parents face those very same challenges um, in a really hostile environment that I think we're seeing a lot of today, but that was just given, right? It was it was overt in the South. That's what life was. That's kind of how you were raised. And so you had to be really thoughtful about if you wanted to live kind of what that looked like. And I think that really shaped 
how I think about what I do, but that no matter what it is, my goal is always to make sure that if I see a barrier, that my focus is on eliminating that barrier. So that as Dr. Wilson just said, the people who are behind me don't have to worry about that. There'll be plenty more, but at least the ones that I can myself really encroach on that I make a point of doing that. Thank you so much, Dr. McCoy. Isaac, would you like to answer the first question? It was, um, what types of activism have you engaged in and what inspired you to pursue activism? Yeah, definitely. So si similar to Dr. McCoy, I probably wouldn't even identify as an activist. I think that um, I've kind of picked up that role more recently just because my research interests have kind of meshed right with the polarization of police community relations right now. Um, but I've definitely been doing community-based work since I was very, very young. Um, I, I, I grew up in an African Methodist Episcopalian church and every year we would have to do an oratory where we'd have to perform a poem that we write or wrote. So I'd always write a poem centered around like community justice issues that I'm working to address um, even as a young kid. So that's really where it started. And then in high school, I went uh, and I did a program called STARS, Students Teaching and Advocating Respect. And um, through that program, we would do an annual um, high school assembly where we would discuss a social justice related issue. So my my kind of interest carried over from very young into high school. And then as I graduated from a college undergrad four years ago, um, I, I, I did volunteer work at a shelter for individuals experiencing homelessness, which led me to kind of not so much my research in, in, in graduate school, but the general idea of that level of on the ground issue, such as individuals experiencing homelessness or addiction or whatever it is, um, that carried over into my research studies. Now, um, I primarily study police community interactions, but I also look at gangs and, and gang formation across the community. And so um, in, in, in doing that research, similar to Dr. Wilson said, I have to be on the ground and I have to be able to apply what my research says because it, it, I find it personally extremely exploitative to be studying issues that are so, so polarizing within communities like Boston, right? And then not doing anything about that, right? So, so I, I always find myself like similar to you, Dr. Wilson, I live in the communities that I research. I'm there every day. I, I, if, if, if I have my hood on, I'm perceived as one of the individuals, right, that, that could get, you know, subjectified to aggressive policing or whatever it is. So I, 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 I have to do, I have to stay grounded in, in, in applying my work and I have to stay grounded and, and really keep in mind that, you know, I, I, even though I look like the people of the community, I have a real advantage as being a PhD student. And so constant um, just understanding of positionality within society is another another thing for me, but yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yablo. And so this sort of transitions us into our second question. Uh, Dr. McCoy, when you were speaking about um, the work that you do, you said that you don't really see yourself as an activist, and, but you hope to work on the internal um, mechanisms within institutions to make it better for people who are coming up or people who are working on the ground within the community. So my second question to the panel would be, what do you hope to achieve through your activism? Well, I know for me, my goal is, I'm a social worker, so I hope to see myself as a change agent. And my goal is to make sure that there's access and opportunity in the places that I am, because I have a privilege of being there where there are not a lot of people. So it may have been where I was the only black social worker in an agency, or I'm one of a few black you know, tenure professors, et cetera. And that I can make sure that I'm changing that environment so that those doors stay open, that I'm not the token person or one of a few because now we've met a goal, but that there is an opportunity for other people who are equally, if not maybe more deserving to be there than I am. So what I can do in, in those particular systems to 
eliminate, eradicate, dismantle all of those barriers is what I really hope that I can accomplish. And part of that is how I present myself, the work that I do. I think it's important that you stay true to yourself. I am very firm in believing that there's no gain to be made by selling your soul. So if you don't believe in what you're doing and what you're saying, nothing can be accomplished. You aren't genuine. You are not opening a door for anyone that may really have, um, you're telling them that what they believe is, is not good enough. And I don't think that's true. So only by being true to myself and then by making sure that people understand that if you are working with me or, or want to accept the work that I'm doing, that that's just what you get, that I'm not willing to change that to kind of fit into the mold. And then to know for other people that that's the opportunity exists for you to be able to do that. And to be okay if people don't want you to, you have to be able to walk away from a, an opportunity if it doesn't match what you're looking for. Thank you, Dr. McCoy. Can you just speak a little bit about uh, when you're doing this work, if you've experienced resistance from people within academia, how is that handled? So how have you handled that? Did you mean me specifically or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, we, it could be a broad question to the panel, so we could come back to, to that one. I think we could all go on. I'll let somebody else go first, but I'm sure we all have 20 stories about that. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really just, um, you know, the retaliation is really just a part of the game. And I, the advice I always give to um, scholars and students of color is just to make sure that you, you familiarize yourself with institutional um, practices, structures, um, and, and then go from there. Because oftentimes, you know, we're told that we can't speak up, but I, I'm the type of person that, you know, I, I speak up. And so if I feel something isn't right, I'm going to speak up because I didn't come into this academy to not speak up, right? Too many people have sacrificed for me to just have the, this opportunity to have this office. Um, to have access to these institutions. And so it would be a slap in the face um, to my ancestors and people that I know who fought um, for me to have these opportunities for me not to say anything. And so one of the ways that I do it is by engaging in public scholarship. I recently um, wrote a piece titled Surviving Academic Cairns While Black, which spoke to some of the harms that come from um, white women in particular who act as allies um, in public, but behind closed doors in these institutions, they act like, you know, the KKK, or they act like a white citizens council. And so I'm willing to speak about it. Um, and I think it's important that other scholars are willing to do so as well, because I think that's the only way that we can potentially change these institutions. Because I found that many of these Karens, um, they fear being exposed publicly. They don't fear the institutions because they know many of these institutions protect their behavior. And so their biggest fear is losing their so-called credibility, their legitimacy, which is oftentimes self-created. And so I think it's a powerful tool for us as scholars to write about these, um, these institutions and structures that we feel are oppressive, that aren't fair, um, that subject us to harms, that don't give um, candidates of color the fair shot you know, to, to have an interview or an opportunity for a job. And so otherwise, if we don't speak up, um, these these institutions and structures will be maintained. And so I, I always just say, and we have the academic freedom to do it. Um, you can write about it. And and I would just advise us to, um, you know, any, any up and coming activist scholar to consider um, potentially, you know, writing about these issues, but do it in a very strategic way, but there's ways to do it. I love that Dr. Wilson talks about you know, calling these things what they are boldly and fearlessly. Um, I definitely faced a lot of retaliation in graduate school for calling out what was happening in my department and saying, I'm not going to allow um, this racism to exist. And then you get called a troublemaker, you get called a problem student, you get called, um, you have to be concerned with what phone calls are made while you're on the job market, right? You have to get concerned about what opportunities will be pulled from you that you didn't even know existed because you have told um, a white woman who fancies herself as an ally that she was racist, right? And, and those things happen. And 
like Dr. Wilson, I have written about these experiences in grad school on my blog because I had to like, I needed that catharsis. Like I was so, it, it was so heavy um, my experiences from graduate school. Um, and now I'm in a much better situation as far as support is concerned. But part of the issue now that I'm super concerned about in a way that I wasn't before is that activism and scholar activism is on trend for the moment, right? So we're doing a lot of panels. We're, we're doing a lot of uh, um, conferences, um, having a lot of dialogues, papers, and, and so on and so forth. And then those of us who are doing the work are out there, right? We're out there regardless, but we're out there in a different way because everybody wants to talk to us about activism because there was a whole uprising this summer. And then in two and three years or in four years, in my case, when I go out for tenure, is it still going to be on trend, right? Like, are all the emails that I got from the administration who said, like, we are, so, this is great. Like, thank you for doing this work. Re a recognition that this work keeps everyone safe, right? Um, is that still going to be valued in the same way? And so for me, it's figuring out, part of it is figuring out, like, how to protect myself in this process. But the other part of it is also, um, I love my job and I love what I do, but I don't do this work for the career of it, right? I do this work because it's meaningful to me and I consider my scholarship as contributing to the project of black liberation, right? And I, can, I consider my place in institutions as a contribution to the project of black liberation. And so like, I don't, this is gonna be real, probably really controversial, but tenure doesn't scare me that much also, right? Because like, if this is not about just the job to me, right? I have to do this work regardless of what the consequences are because as Sean points out, so many before us <laughs> have done this work, um, and face a lot worse consequences than a tenure denial. Um, so I think we need to change the circumstances that would make that even a question for me. Um, but also, you know, for me, it's like, I can't imagine being quiet because I may not get tenure if I'm not quiet, right? Like <laughs> I can't even fathom. Thank you so much, Dr. Battle. It seems like um, the goal is much bigger than tenure. What you're doing and the change that you're making and, and the impact that you're hoping to have is much bigger than tenure. And so that desire for that change, that motivates you and that, that sort of guides your actions as opposed to whether you get tenure or not. So thank you. Um, Mr. Yablo, would you like to answer that question? So um, the question was, uh, what do you hope to achieve through activism? And then also we were talking about any um, tensions that you might have experienced in academia as it relates to your activism. Yeah, so I think I wanted to touch on the first thing with, with tensions between academia and activism, because for me, as I said before there, directly aligned so like especially right now with you know the heinous murder of george floyd and, and many other situations like that that are now becoming more polarized and so i have to and and you know an example would be in my in my hometown of of cambridge massachusetts there's been no like numerous rallies this past summer that you know i participated in and spoken um and then i have to remember that I also live there, right? And so it, it, it becomes a very real situation where um, you, like, again, being shameless with my wording, but also having to remember like this has real life consequences, but then transitioning um, similar to the way that Dr. Battle said, tenure isn't everything. For me, I, I, I wanna follow up with something controversial, probably like a PhD to me isn't everything. Like I, I still have responsibilities that I have to do PhD or not PhD student candidate, you know, through my dissertation, whatever it is, right? And so, I, I, but again, keeping in mind what my end goal is, but also remembering that it's my 
individual personal end goal is not more important than the end goal of my people or really just the humanity like because it seems more recently right now like humanity is in mind but there's definitely direct tension as a student that studies policing um concentrated urban disadvantage from not only like a sociological standpoint but also from like a public policy standpoint and and trying to remember and maintaining that immediate change is probably not going to happen but that doesn't mean that you don't give up and also maintaining that the language that i use on the street when i'm talking to people is different than academic language or language in public policy and so i i'm i'm, I'm working on right now and trying to figure out the way to bridge that gap but just maintaining that you know it is it, rome wasn't built in a day and that it's you know, a constant, constant work in progress. So Dr. Adams, I'd like to share kind of a different perspective on this. So um, the first thing I thought of when you said experiences, I thought about when I was a doctoral student and I was taking a class where I was one, um, it was a class combined of social work students and MDs. And the instructor was talking about a research study and basically said that poor people had no moral compass. And I was shocked to say the least. And I said, and I was one of two black people in the class. The other person was a male MD and she's, she was an instructor who had an extraordinarily high opinion of MDs. They could do no wrong about anything. And so um, I said, what do you mean poor people have no moral compass? I could not get past that statement. I was shocked. And she began to berate me until the black MD stepped in and agreed with me and she backed off. Hmm. And so I didn't think anything of it because this person had a reputation for not necessarily being um, the most in touch researcher, but certainly had an, ex had an international reputation, which is why she had the class. But she proceeded to report me to my, uh, my advisor and the head of my fellowship at a five-year funded fellowship. Wow. thinking that, I don't know what she thought, but I guess she thought I would get in trouble, but because of her own reputation, it didn't work out that way. So the advantage to me in that situation was that I had built up enough goodwill in the short time that I was there and she'd built up enough not goodwill that it didn't turn out that way. But I, I learned a lesson there in terms of, I wasn't about to change what I was saying or thinking, but I did recognize the need to have goodwill and to know who it was you were going to challenge when and how you were going to do it. And so it's interesting because all of my colleagues have said tenure is not important to them. It wouldn't matter. It mattered to me. I am single, self-sustaining, income. <laughs> it, it mattered to me. I was very focused on I needed a job to support me for the rest of my life because I am the person that takes care of myself. However, it was also important to me because I felt the need to be able to, I felt like disrupt kind of the systems that I see that only tenure and a PhD could get me in the world that I live in that I could say things I wanted to say, but that without a certain reputation, it wouldn't get heard. And, and I'm certainly not silly enough to think that I have so much power that everything I say people believe or is important, but I do know that I do have some level of influence over some certain aspects. And I knew that tenure would allow me the chance to be able to have that opportunity. So for me tenure was important for me having that opportunity was important and for me moving forward and maybe one day getting full or whatever that looks like is important because i know it opens doors that otherwise i wouldn't have access to and i wouldn't be able to get the support that i think i have and can get without it so i think there's you know there's always two roads there's two ways to do something there's two perspectives i'm um, the perspective that it was important and i i would probably still feel the same way tomorrow if i didn't have it but it was because I had a very clear goal about how I wanted to use it, both for me as a person individually, but for me professionally and kind of my field. I'm in a field that I think people believe that as social workers, we're all about social justice and racial justice. And we get you know, to be excused from all this other stuff. And the fact is, that's a lie. The fact is, we perpetuate racism like everyone else. And so it was important for me to, as a social worker, be able to confront those ideas and knowing that one thing that I could do was be a tenured professor at the school that I'm at with having gotten the degree that I got it at to be able to at least have an edge up to, to be engaged in that way. 
So I wanted to put an opposite perspective out there about that. And I, I just want to say, to be clear, especially people from my institution are here, right? I am, tenure is important to me, right? Like I'm, I'm an, I am, a, I do academic work. I'm trying to pursue tenure, right? I, what I would, what I'm saying is that tenure is not the end all, be all to me. And I feel like when tenure is like dangled like a carrot, that we, then we can't and to the point that it freezes us, right? That it, it prevents us from doing anything except walking these lines, these boundaries that they've set out and said, if you step right here, you're you're jeopardizing your chances, right? That's the way that I'm like, oh, I can't get behind that. And I know for some people, they have to, you know, engage in a certain way pre-tenure because tenure is the end all be all and, and that's understandable, right? Too, but... So I am, of course, I want to stay in academia. That's the profession I've, I've picked, right? And I think that I am able to do a lot of work that's important. Um, and I think that it's important for my Black face to stand in front of a classroom and talk about some of these things, particularly at Wake Forest, which is a very white institution. Um, and so I do want to continue that. And I do want to be able to have to be in that space for my black and brown students, especially, right? So that they can um, have that, you know, that je ne sais quoi <laughs> that we can have as, as faculty of color, as black women um, in, the, in a space um, and, and offer that support to my students. So I definitely, I do wanna get tenure, right? Um, but I'm still gonna be protesting. <laughs> so I think that's, that's that point. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Vato. And I think uh, the, the panel really raises a lot of the different perspectives that people come to academia with, right? And uh, some of the different tensions that people experience and just thinking about how to address that. And I believe earlier, Dr. Wilson, you were speaking about the importance of just speaking up and just speaking about your experiences because for a lot of people within academia, you experience isolated incidents and that you don't speak about it, right? You don't think that um, you don't share those experiences as much and, and you, you try to deal with those incidents individually, right? But it's part of a larger problem, right? Part of discrimination that women of color, people of color and women experience within academia. So Dr. Basil, you also mentioned that you speak about your experiences on your blog, right? The experiences that you had during grad school, you spoke about them on your blog. And so I guess one of my last questions for the panel before we open it up is that thinking about the way you approach academia, what advice would you have for scholars coming up? So people who experience discrimination in academia, but also people who are interested in activism, how would you advise them to approach academia and activism? Well, I would say for, it's important to really be your authentic self. And there have been many I guess lies that I've heard about academia where you have to be, you know, this type of person, you have to wear, you know, I was told you have to wear a bow tie and a suit and and I'm not that type of person. So, you know, that automatically hit me a type of way, like, damn, I have to wear a suit. Like, I don't do any of that. Um, but then, you know, I, I, as I navigated academia, you know, I found that it's really, to be honest, to keep it a buck, I'm gonna keep it hundred with y'all. Tenure to me is not that hard, especially at my institution, it's a teaching school. And see, I look at all, all the other things that other people have done to get tenure. I know there are clear differences, right, when it comes to race and, and gender and things of that nature are oftentimes held to a higher standard, but it really isn't that hard. I think many of these institutions try to make it seem to be so hard and unattainable because that prevents you from being your authentic self. It, present, it prevents you from resisting because you're so scared, you know, you're walking around like um, like you're walking on eggshells. And, and, and that's really... It, well, I guess it depends on the institution you're at, but in my case, I'm like, that's it. This is easy. I'm like, I kind of wish it, you know, it, it, cause I'm, I guess, cause I'm productive and I have a passion for, for what I do, but it's like, nothing can hold me down. So I don't, I don't really care if you try to retaliate. And I saw a question in the chat, somebody asked, you know, what about retaliation in RTP? If you do not get tenure, was the activism or speaking out worth it? Sometimes as blacks, we often find that even if you don't speak out, you could still be targeted. 
So it's kind of like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And so I'm the type of person that's like, shoot, y'all don't like me anyway. So I'm going to speak out and challenge your racist, oppressive institution, practices, policies, and the whole nine. Like, I'm not just going to sit back and act scared because I want to get tenure. Like, to me, tenure doesn't mean that much. I'm a hustler. I'm a very creative person. So if academia doesn't work out, I'll find another way to you know, to make money. I don't, I don't think that that's going to happen. I'll find a way to engage in the community and, and, and change society. Like, I don't need this ivory tower for me to do the work that, that, I, that I'm doing. You know, I love teaching, especially where I teach. It's a, it's a um, minority serving institution. So the majority of my students are black and brown kids from the hood. So I motive, they motivate me and I motivate them to be great. And so that's, that's really my passion is for my students, um, for the community. And if tenure comes with it, that's cool. If it doesn't, I'll probably have to figure something else out. But that's like, that's just something that I navigate. You know, I, I think about that, you know, as when it comes time to, um, to go up, I have a couple of years left, but you know, that will get here when it gets here. I'm not really concerned about, um, you know, any of those other things. I'm not really fearful of, of what these institutions can do to me because I do my job. And there are legal ramifications, right? If they try to hinder your progress and your ability to um, matriculate within these institutions. And so I think it's important for us as, as people of color and marginalized people to familiarize yourself with the different offices, policies, laws, because those things can be used to, to protect, you, you can use those to protect yourself. Definitely, like I, I saw that question also, Dr. Wilson, about is it worth it if I don't get tenure? Yes, it's worth it. Like I have to be able to sleep at night and and getting tenure is not going to make me sleep at night. And if I, if I have really done what I feel called, propelled to do, right? Like I, this summer, it was crucial to me. And I think y'all, I said at the beginning, like I did not have intention of organizing in that way this summer. It was my first summer out of grad school in nine years. I finally had a salary. I was like, let me go sit down and like, you know, see what happens this summer, work on my book. And then when the uprisings were happening, like there was no way I was going to be in my house working on my book and people are out in the street putting their body on the line. Like, that's just not what I, like my spirit moved me to be out there. So I had to move in that way. Um, everybody couldn't be out there and I understand that but for me I was in the position to and I felt compelled to and so yeah I had to and at the end of the day like like all of this work is not about me right so if I don't get tenure it's like okay but I still the work that we did my comrades and I did this summer on the ground like hopefully keeps folks safe, like prevent someone else from getting murdered in a detention center. And then their family has to wait six months to know what happened to them. Like that's, that's, that's what needs to change, right? Like this thing is not about me, you know, publishing these articles and, you know, like out, like Dr. Wilson said, we'll be okay. We'll all be okay. We have PhDs, like it, it's going to be all right. Um, but there's folks out there that if some of this work is not done, won't be all right, like literally may lose their lives behind some of this stuff. And so for me, like, that's what I'm concentrating on, right? Like, can I sleep at night with the decisions that I make about how I spend my time and what I do? Um, and I don't think I could sleep at night if I felt compelled to speak on something or to participate in some way or move in some way and I didn't because I was scared about academia. Thank you so much. Would any of the other panelists like to speak to the last question? So what advice do you have for scholars who are interested in activism and also people who experience discrimination in academia? I think I would say for people to remember that there's no one way to do something so people are activists in their hearts and the way you choose to do it is good enough, right? So I'm really clear, I'm not the person out there with a the sign, but I think I have the mighty pen and I try to use it very well. Um, I try to use it to not only share my voice, but hopefully my voice represents other people and it can make a difference in that way. And so I think if you try to force yourself to be something or do something that you're not, it's disingenuous and it doesn't work. 
So you have to figure out who you are, what you want to do, and then do it with gusto, right? Find support, do it, stick to it, um, and make sure it really accurately reflects how you feel. I mean, my work, my research generally focuses on young Black men and Black men in the, um, who are justice involved, more recently um, emerging adults, 18 to 24, who've experienced violence. And what I've experience this year is that I can't write about that right now. Now, typically, that is the way I think that I move forward activism because I think it's important because I have learned and heard um, their stories that it's my job and responsibility to share those because they don't get heard because they're the least cared about population. But I'm not able to do that right now because that's all I see on TV. And so I have to remember self care within that. So instead of focusing on that, I've tried to find other ways to kind of share what I think is important. So I've kind of moved my writing in a different direction, right? I've talked about being black in academia. I've talked about, um, you know, how black people are being treated right now and how it's compared to what we were treated like in the last century, um, et cetera. So I think my activism has, my heart has stayed the same, but how I'm doing it is different. And that's okay. I think we have to forgive ourselves sometimes. I think. We know as academics, we are always, our expectations for ourselves are very high. We are always constantly trying to achieve something, be it in our protest lives, our writing lives, our teaching lives, we have extraordinarily high bars for ourselves. And we have to kind of let that go and give ourselves permission right now as black people to know that the expectations for ourselves are really high, but that we also feel a tug and commitment to the people in our lives, including ourselves. And so if you don't recognize that, you're doomed to not be successful in anything that you do. And so we have to figure out, my advice is figure out what you can do and do it well and be successful at it. And if you can't do it all, that's okay because already we expect too much of ourselves. And right now we have to give ourselves permission to just not be okay sometimes. And we have to find our peers, whoever those are to share that because we are in a profession that most people already don't get Right. When you try to explain your job, people don't get it. They think you teach three hours and you have summers off. And we all know how that's not true. Right. And so you're battling that. And so to explain to someone how hard this job might be right now and how there's even more expectations. You know, Dr. Battle talked earlier about her concern that the momentum will leave. And I think we all have that concern that, you know, no one will, you know, the panels will go away. The the calls for articles will go away. All this stuff is going to go away when people get over it. And so part of the flip side of that is that we're then also trying to be responsive and engaged because it feels like, well, you better do it now because who knows in two years if anyone's going to care what you have to say. But the problem with that is that it creates even more tension and exhaustion and we're already exhausted. So we have to find a balance. We have to support each other. And you have to just figure out what you can do and be okay with it. And if you need a break, take a break, you know, and if you need to go 70 miles an hour for the next month, do it, but then no, you can't do that for the duration. So. Thank you so much, Dr. McCoy. I'd reiterate that, uh, that exact point. I think that there's multiple ways to fight, you know, the same kind of war. Um, and I, I I always tell myself, you know, there's a the bunch of different individual battles, and then there's the there's the war, and and you know, similar to you, Dr. McCoy, I I do I I will go out and protest with the sign occasionally, but a lot of the time, my work is more I don't want to say more calculated, but a lot more behind the scenes, if you will, where I'm actually kind of, you know working with individuals behind the scenes to change legislation and write, write things into legislation um, based on individual experiences and taking, using my research a lot of the time and bringing it directly through my, the connections that I've been able to make because I am, I am not necessarily, in, I, I have a future in applied sociology, which is uh, more broad, not necessarily in academia. I definitely don't rule it out, but so a lot of my work is doing on the ground work with like local government and nonprofits. And so using their data and their experience to drive policy too. But I would just say to just, just remember that there's multiple ways to fight the same, the same kind of battle. Thank you so much, Ms. Diablo. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to take a questions from a uh, audience, so you could raise your hand and we'll call on you or you could just jump in.
So while people are getting ready to raise their hand, okay, so we do have some people who have raised their hands. So um, the first question will be from Sebastian. Hi, everybody. Um, I know a few of you, and I want to really thank you for this panel. Uh, it's really between exhausting and inspiring. Um, and I and I do want to ask a, um, a question or, or a couple of questions to to the panel and, and see what what your thoughts are. Um, I have this feeling that that I the dichotomy between academia and activism only works to one side when activism comes for social justice. U.S. academia was at the forefront and is still at the forefront of U.S. imperialism. The Chicago boys who promoted the Pinochet coup and supported the Pinochet regime, they're still being read in graduate programs. Last year, there was a coup in Bolivia that the argument used for the coup was uh, fraud in the elections. And the argument was developed because a Georgetown professor who was running the statistics for the, um, the American States Organization made an error and that was used to justify the coup. So it's, and, and nobody, you know, that guy wasn't punished, that guy didn't lose tenure or things like that. So it seems to me that the dichotomy between academia and, and, and uh, activism always comes when that activism is directed towards social justice. And my second point, which is related to that and, and, and wondering what you guys thought is, you know, we all produce knowledge but it seems to me that oftentimes we produce that knowledge for a small group of people that can access that knowledge. Um, and, you know, because of the language that we use or because of the things that we published. And we are forced to do that because of the tenure process, how it works. And, you know, the world tends to see the US as the model to follow, especially when it comes to academia, but there are other models outside there. And I'll give one example uh, for us to think about. So in Uruguay, where I come from, um, there's the second most re read, uh, read newspaper. Around 30% of the articles that are published there are from academics. So I'm not sure that, so, so my, you know, regardless of, of the difference and so on, it seems to me that, that and nobody, you know, and, and that we need to figure a way in which we can communicate our ideas and the knowledge that we produce to the general public, not, you know, and, and not be punished for doing that and not having to do double or triple work because not only we need to tra translate our work for the general public, but then we need to publish that work in academic languages in order to gain tenure. So I was wondering what, what the panelists uh, think about, you know, these issues. And thank you very much for sharing. It's really, really inspiring. Sebastian, thank you. First of all, thank you for pointing out that academia, sociology, criminology are imperialist institutions, right? And that's not really talked about at all. Um, we're very American centric, um, which is also a huge problem. I wanna talk, speak to your second point about um, like this model of knowledge dissemination, which I hate about academia, right? Like we're forced to publish papers that seven people read and that's how we get tenure. It's just, it's horrible. Um, so one of the things that we had, I had been doing with my comrades here is literally we were doing teach-ins on the corner, like meet at seven o'clock we ordered some pizzas and we're like reading Angela Davis and listening to Asada and watch and like literally we were projecting speeches onto the side of the detention center um, playing the volume as loud as we could even so that folks who were in the detention center could hear um, and having dialogues and and like I'm, just, I think that we need to get out of the walls of academia completely, right? Um, I think, especially as an abolitionist, like we need to be informed by folks who have been and are still under the thumb of the carceral state. Um, 
And so that requires us to get outside of the walls. I think one of the ways that we can do it within or closer, I mean, you could say within the, the, the models that academia requires us to follow is participatory action research, um, which I've done some of because that's actually having the community completely a part of everything that's happening as far as the um, research design, data collection, data analysis, um, the action initiatives, right? All of those components so that it's not us coming in from the ivory tower and saying to the community, like, this is what we decided you need based on this GIS analysis or whatever, right? Like actually making sure that the community's voice is central and we're somewhere, you know, on the outskirts of it. Um, but I think we need to do a much better job of finding, as Dr. Williams has said in the chat, um, like many times, right? Like we have, these things have to, we, our metrics have to change in academia. And that just doesn't, that can't come from individuals, but that has to come from the institution so that the things, you know, when people are trying to get tenure, the things that we're evaluated on that, you know, public engagement, public scholarship, community education, community political education count. And that not just, you know, articles and top journals count. And that, that has to be an institutional push. So Sebastian, I'm, you know, I'm a social worker who does work in the area of criminology and sociology. I have an undergraduate degree in sociology and I have a law degree, but I'm a social worker in terms of how I approach work. And I will say, I think one of the things that I, I benefit from, and particularly the institution that I'm at, is that our focus is on making sure that the community is engaged in the work that we do in our perspective and how we do it and the questions that we ask. And I think that makes it valuable. You know, it makes me think back to when I was a doctoral student and the first criticism that my chair gave me or my advisor at the time was that I wrote like a journalist. <laughs> and at the time, right, that's supposed to be an insult. But it's interesting considering I just spent the last year as an op-ed fellow learning how to write op-eds so that I could communicate effectively in journalistic mediums so that I could reach a broader audience and that that's kind of where we've moved during that time period. And so I think it is important that we do publish those academic mediums, but if we aren't having the people that we're interested in um, talking about being engaged in the work, then what we're doing really is useless because we're only telling the story that we think and we're not telling the story that's most important that'll make the difference. And so I think it is institutional, but I also think that it's area specific. I think fields of work have to move in that direction to recognize the value of the people that you're writing about and that it's important not to write about, but to write with. Um, and if we don't do that, then we really kind of move forward a continued paternalistic viewpoint on who we are and our expertise when in fact, we don't have the expertise, we're writing about what we think we know, so. And I also think it's it's important that, you know, I think Sebastian raised some important points, especially when it comes to uh, the production of knowledge in the academy. And, you know, I think about the, the conversations around um, defunding and abolishing police. And I'm like, we need to, you know, after we, hopefully we can abolish the police, if not, um, but if we are, we need to move on to abolishing academia because these structures and institutions really aren't for us. And I oftentimes find that even, even people of color buy into the elitism and, and the rankings and all of that as well, which oftentimes you know, legitimizes these, these anti-Black and, and anti-BIPOC um, institutions. And so we need to be very careful when buying into um, the rankings and the elitism and, and, and all of that. And, and that there are many institutions and places that will value you and you will have the ability to engage in, in the production of, of knowledge. Um, and so I think we also need to be intentional with how we support these institutions, how we feed into um, elitism and, and all of that. Thank you. So we have time for a couple more questions. You could raise your hand. I got we got some questions in the chat earlier. So um, I'll ask one from the chat and then I'll take another one from uh, if anyone raised their hand. So one of the questions from the chat was, <clears throat> I'm preparing my third year review 
at UNC Chapel Hill. I'd love to hear how panelists discussed slash presented their activism in their dossier. How did you demonstrate impact? Well, at, 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 I think it's important, especially in these times that a lot of institutions are actually claiming to allegedly support activism and community engagement. I don't know if it's like that at your institution, but I know a lot of institutions now are trying to engage in, you know, kind of uh, performative um, ally is allyship and symbolic allyship. And so I would say that in these times, you should speak to that. So if, 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 the, if, you know, if the institution claims to be committed to the type of work you're doing, highlight it. You know, you've claimed, you know, in your statement about Black Lives Matter, you're saying that this is important. Well, look what I'm doing. I'm out in the streets. Um, I'm out working with nonprofit organizations. I'm, I'm part of this committee. Um, you should speak to that because I think many institutions nowadays are, are beginning to kind of have to embrace us for, for being our true authentic selves. And it's really a unique time because I'm looking at all the various calls that I haven't seen in years that you could tell they're geared towards um, increase in diversity. And so I just think you really should just embrace who you are. And if they have a problem with it, then um, and I, me personally, I would tell them they kiss my ass, but I know that that's probably not everybody, but um, I would just speak to, to what it is you're doing and, and be comfortable with that, especially in, in, in the Black Lives Matter era when a lot of these institutions are trying to do a little bit better. So let's let them, you know, if, if you're committed to this, let's see how you respond to, to my activism. Hold them accountable. Thank you for answering that because I typed that question. But, um, and I guess I'll add to that because the, the thing that I think um, is important to bring up about the tenure process, particularly at, at research intensive institutions is that they claim to care about the, the activism, but of course they want it tied to money, right? Like I, I always hear, you know, at our school of medicine, well, you know, we really want our, our professors to be engaged in the community, we value community engaged work, but did you apply for that NIH grant? You know, so it's like, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. So that's really where that question was coming from. You know, I definitely, um, you know, I think hold true to, to the work that, that I do, particularly with, with black folks with disabilities. Um, but at the end of the day, I know that a panel of, pe uh, of people, not, I won't even say my peers, but there are gonna be a panel of people that say all of this is well and good, but how much money did you bring us? Because at the end of the day, it's a 500 million plus dollar enterprise that I work in. Um, so, but you're right. Um, so, I don't know if I'll say kiss my ass, but I'll be saying something. <laughs> so I'll just say about the money. I'm in. A, I'm at UIC, I'm in an R01. Um, I think you have to be savvy about money. I've applied for my share of money and gotten my share of money, right? And I've gotten money I didn't expect to get most times. <laughs> I think you have to be savvy and figure out how you make the money work for you so that you can make the impact that you wanna have. And sometimes that's um, using the call for whatever it is someone's trying to fund and making it work around your research. I'll give you an example. My first grant out of graduate school was from Robert Wood Johnson. I'm not a quote unquote health researcher. I do mental health. I'm, you know, I do young black men in the justice system who have mental health needs, um, not generally what they fund, but I made a way to make it work for what they were looking for related to health outcomes. And so in the end, I kind of got what they wanted. They got something unique, but I made it work for me. And that also then worked for my university at the time where I was, and then I came to UIC because they got to have someone who got Robert Wood Johnson money and I got to put it on my CV. So my advice there is to figure out the calls that work for you and then to find people who've received funding from that institution or from that source or whatever to help you make it work. You know, my experience has been, and, and certainly for me and I know colleagues, if anyone's ever emailed me and asked me for help with looking at a grant, making suggestions, whatever, I'm always willing to say yes, because it's hard for us. And it's really hard for us because the areas that we're interested in, a lot of people don't care about. You know, I'm often stuck in between the fact that NIJ has often thought well, it's mental health, NIMH should take care of that. And NIMH just thought, well, it's juvenile offenders, so NIJ should, or OJJDP should take care of that. And so nobody ever wants to take care of anything. So part of it is using the network that you have to help you make it work for you so that it works for your university. And that can take a little effort, but I think we've all been there. 
and we're all generally invested in one and everybody to be successful at it because we know how hard it is. So I invite you to reach out to me. I may not be in your area, but I think all of us can connect you to someone who can because it is important. And I think rethink money. I mean, I've, I've realized through my doctor program and, and laid on that money is important because it lets me get access to stuff that nobody else is going to give me. So when I can have my $1.5 million grant, it lets me get access to populations that nobody else cares about and that they then can't say, well, that's not important because somebody cared enough to give me the money for it. So I think part of it is rethinking what money means. It's not just about them, but how can it give you open doors that you otherwise wouldn't have? Make it, think of it as you know, the tool that you have that nobody can take away from you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the panel for the panelists? So another question that was in the chat earlier was, has there been retaliation from other black faculty at your respective institutions? You always um, live by, you know, the saying, um, what is it all? Skin folk ate your kin folk, right? And so unfortunately that's kind of been a reality for me that I don't really have people who look like me who are really true supporters and that's okay. You wanna find people that have your back, um, that su support you as a scholar, teacher, professional and, and ride with those people. And oftentimes it, it, it may be people who look nothing like you or people you would, who have nothing in common um, with you. And, and that's okay. And I always you know, tell graduate students and junior faculty members that be careful of who you consider to be, you know, especially at your institutions, who you consider to be a, a, an ally, um, a mentor. Let that kind of happen organically. And, and we go into many of us, especially people of color, we go into these institutions thinking, well, you know, this person is black or this person's Hispanic. Um, they'll get it, they'll have my back. And that's really not always the, the reality. So you just want to be mindful. Um, and I would say, question kind of everybody, everybody's um, what they stand for, um, their authenticity. Um, you want to you want to pay close attention to that. Um, because it you know, you'll find that people who look like you aren't always going to support your activism or your scholarship, although even the way you do things, right, they may do things differently. And, and that's okay. So I would just be mindful of that when, when, when navigating um, these institutions. Thank you. And we have another question from the chat. Is activism learned, taught, or is it a mindset? Well, I think it can be all those things. You know, I've certainly seen people, I mean, you know, Dr. Battle talked about her, you know, walking out of a class, <laughs> right? So I think, you know, clearly for her, that was early on. I mean, I think for me, it was just the house that I was raised in and my own parents' experiences. But I certainly know people who, you know, really had a very isolated experience growing up and have had the world open up to them and have decided that that's the path they want to take. So I don't think that there is one way or the other. That, it, that people turn out that way. I think you have to find a cause that, that you're passionate about and that's what you decide you wanna pursue. I'm actually doing a project now um, looking at the pathways to abolition. Um, and it, virtually everyone that we're talking to so far are just like explaining their journey, right? So even if this is something that is something that you felt like, you know, activism was something that you were drawn to as a kid. I think it's a journey for all of us to figure out what it looks like at a different point. And in different times in our lives, it looks different, right? There were times when I wasn't in the streets like that. And then this summer I was, and maybe I'm gonna get out of the streets going forward, you know, like how we engage with, with activism and with organizing work is always gonna be a journey and the ways that we engage with these like frameworks, right? So abolition was definitely a journey for me. I wasn't always out here talking about 
abolish the prison industrial complex. Like there was a time when if you had talked to me, I might have said we can reform. We got to get like better people to be police, right? Like I might have had those conversations in high school or, you know, early undergrad or whatever. But I think all I think ultimately it's it's overall like definitely a process. And the the reason that I we've called our our grassroots organizations triad abolition project is because these things are projects also, right? Like we're contributing to um, these things along the way. For me, I don't expect abolition to happen in my lifetime, but I know it's something that we're contributing to. Um, so yeah, I agree with Dr. McCoy is all of those things. Thank you, Dr. Battle. I would just like to tell everyone who joined us today, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for participating and thank you for your questions. And, and to our panelists, that thank you so much uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, your advice. Thank you.